Hello? We good? All right, good evening. Uh, we're going to call this meeting to order. Uh, Pastor, you want to lead us in prayer? Opening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for coming and, and uh, just for your presence here tonight uh, as we handle kind of some things for the church. And so appreciate you all being here this evening. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, give you thanks for this day and for the blessings that you give to us each and every day of life. Thank you for your church. Thank you for St. Paul uh, here in Sheboygan Falls and for uh, all the different ministries and all the different programs that you have given us uh, as we seek to go about our mission of connecting people to Christ. Lord, we ask that uh, you continue to bless the work that we do here, that you continue to work through uh, programs and volunteers to share that good news of the hope that we have in Jesus with many more people so that they would come to know your great love given to us in your son. I pray that you be with us here tonight, uh, that you bless us with your presence, that any discussion would be uh, fruitful and edifying, uh, and that you would just bless our conversation and our time together this evening. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Minor technical difficulties. Uh, okay, so the next item is the secretary's report from the April 19th congregational meeting, which should be right behind the, the agenda. We just need approval <clears throat> on the minutes. Have a second. All in favor of approving the meeting minutes from the last congregational meeting say aye. aye. Opposed? Next up is the treasurer's report. Okay. Our, our first report is the average receipts report in which we compare this fiscal year, 11 months ended May 31st to that of the prior fiscal year. The column on the left is this year, to its right is last year, and the far right column shows us the change year over year. We look at average weekly because at times the periods year to year do not line up, so average weekly is our best measure. As you can see, our average weekly is 23,499, which is an increase of 5.9% over last year. Moving down to missions, we have a slight decrease, 1.4%. Capital improvements, a strong increase of 9.1%. The parking lot fund also increased 16.3%. All in all, our total weekly receipts this year over last year is up 5.9%. Do we have any questions on that? Okay. Moving on to the next page. This shows our revenues and our expenses for the 11 months ended May. That's our left-hand column. The middle column shows what we had budgeted for these 11 months. The far right column shows whether a category is favorable or unfavorable. I would just like to call your attention to the very first line, the general and communi communion offerings. We are within $5,800 of budget. Um, that's pretty incredible. It's a very good result. Our blessings continue, and I want to thank every one of you for your faithful support. The expenses, again, are shown category by category. Going down to the bottom line, you will see that we have favorable to budget 164, 234. Now, there's a couple of main reasons for that 
um, excess surplus that we've generated so far. We are under budget significantly for th three big reasons. Our benefits and wages, having an open position all year long, and also less support for ECC. There were a number of unusual things that happened in ECC this year. We received state grants, which came out of the blue, very unexpected. Um, early childhood was also blessed by some significant donations and memorial. So just these three items, the wages, benefits, and early childhood support attribute 83% of the underspending. So right now we are at a surplus year to date of 144,477. Are there any questions on this report? Yes, Dave. Would the surplus be able to be used for the parking lot funds? Um, typically, the surplus goes into the Ministry Development Fund and has not been allocated to capital spending. It's got to come from somewhere for the parking lot, correct? Right, but a, a decision was made uh, when the parking lot project was approved to take whatever was needed, aside from the parking lot fund, out of our building fund. Anybody else? Okay. The next page gives us a breakdown of the dedicated funds by category. And just as a reminder, dedicated funds are those contributed or raised for a particular reason. Those funds are to be used for that reason only. Those funds are not available to pay our operating expenses. So our capital improvements is at 208, 285. The parking lot presently, 11,293. Stained glass fund, 13, 156. Building fund, 451 874. So the building related portion is 684 607. Ministry development is standing at 400 193. The next number is a conglomeration of all ministry accounts and dedicated 296 114 for a million 380 914. Early childhood has 12,267. Gathering place, 205,023 for a grand total of 1,598,205. The section shown at the bottom of that page just breaks down donations that the church has received in the last 11 months and where they were allocated. In what fund? Um, I don't know. Seven, seven hundred something? High seven hundreds? Okay, around seven hundred. We can get you an exact number. Okay. Then this graph, again, is just a, another display showing you by category where our dedicated funds reside. Right, endowment fund is not part of that. Only their, yeah, only 80,000 is in this graph. The other endowment fund investments are outside of the dedicated. Questions on that? Okay, if there are no questions, we need a motion to approve the May 2022 Treasurer's Report. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you, Donna. Uh, next up is the 2022-23 budget. <laughs> I 
At the last meeting, I realized I needed glasses to see this, so <laughs> these are just for you guys. Um, so the 2022-23 budget, I realize that you can't read what is up on the screen, so it is in your packets. Um, I just put it up there so you kind of know what page we're on. Um, <clears throat> so this is a snapshot of our budget for this upcoming year. If you, the top portion uh, up until the shaded line is the income and then the bottom half is expenses. The green column is actual from last year. So we go from July until June. So this would have been July of 21 through, no, July of 20 to June of 21. Then the um, yellow column is this current year. And w this is 11 months um, of the budget. And then I estimate the month of June. Um, what I think is going to come, we have a couple more weeks left, but it's our, it's our best guess. 11 months actual and um, estimating the month of June. So if you look at the very far bottom line of the yellow column, you'll see that um, at this point, we are estimating a surplus to end the fiscal year of 147668 which is an amazing surplus. Um, and Donna kind of mentioned the reasons for that already. Then if you go into the bluish column, that is what we are looking at for this next upcoming year. So we basically our process, we start in March. Um, I meet with all of the staff and the directors and they lay out their budgets, what they think they're gonna be planning for the upcoming year. And then we meet as a group um, and, and discuss those things. And then we bring it to council. Um, as far as staffing goes, the personnel team, which is made up of our president, vice president, head elder and treasurer, they make all of the personnel decisions as far as merit increases, changes with um, health insurance, that sort of thing. Um, and then it all comes into this final budget. So that's kind of where that um, blue line comes from. So what we do is we figure out our expenses and because we're a nonprofit, we need to break zero or break even at the end. So you can see at the very bottom of the blue column, it is a dash. So we want it to be zero, that's the goal. <clears throat> so to do that, we figure out our expenses and then it all comes down to regular envelopes. The very top line is the number that we have to meet um, through giving to meet all of those expenses. And so this year, it would be a 4.1 increase in giving <clears throat> to meet the expenses that we are expecting for this upcoming year. Um, any questions about that? And I'll go into a, a little more detail um, on that in a minute. Okay, the next page. So our expenses, we are looking at $1.3 million in expenses. That seems like a big number and it is. This is where, how it's broken down. Um, so it is primarily staffing. Staffing and benefits, um, we're at 927,000 in, in just that. And that's expected, this is a service organization. Um, we're a people business, that's, that's kind of what we do. So that's where the majority of our expense goes to. Then the next area is building and grounds. What it takes to keep up the building, all the heat, the electrical, um, snow plowing, keeping the lights on, any maintenance, all that sort of thing falls into that next category there. Then support and admin expenses. So that's um, paper, office equipment, copy supplies, telephone, um, books, ministry, uh, not ministry stuff, that's down farther. Um, basically what it takes to keep, the biz to keep everything running um, from an administrative standpoint, not staffing wise. Then um, the next section is our ECC support. That's the next sliver. And that is what, whatever the school doesn't cover. Um, they use tuition to pay for most of their expenses, but they are not able to cover it completely. Uh, the, the church has made a commitment that we support that 
ministry and we want kids to be able to go we want families to be able to afford to go so we do raise tuition moderately but it's never enough to cover the costs but we want the kids to be able to go and families to be able to afford it so we don't raise the rates astronomically um, and then the last piece is ministry expenses so that would be all the curriculum um, everything that Nicole does in youth and children, all the Sunday school stuff, all the supplies for that, the Bible studies, um, anything they use in worship, all of that falls under ministry expenses. So that's kind of how that is broken out. Then if you look at the next graph, um, so what we end up with from last year to this year is a $197,000 increase of expenses. And as you can see from the, the graph there, 41% of that is filling that open position, which we're gonna be talking about next on the agenda. Um, it will be filling um, Jeff Diener's old position. So that is the majority of the, or 41% of that increase. Then the next um, area is just small adjustments, which on that very first colorful um, grid I gave you, you can see where all those kind of line items come in. Then 20% is merit and wage increases for staff. And then 17% the, uh, is health insurance um, increases, which happen every year. <laughs> the last graph I'd like to show you it's that same number, 197,000 in expenses, as I mentioned, is what we're gonna have this upcoming year. Only a very small portion of that is not covered. And that's what this graph shows you. So this year, as I mentioned, we are looking at $147,000 surplus. So we're covering, covering our expenses that much this year. So next year, we think our expenses will be 197,000, but of that 147, we already covered this year. So we really only have a $49,000 increase in giving needed to cover our expenses. Does that make sense? I've been practicing how to explain that. Um, but <clears throat> having that surplus is a huge, huge benefit for our church. And so really to absorb that slight increases um, is, is really small. It's, I've been here for 11 years. I think this is the smallest um, increase I've seen. So, and probably one of the biggest um, surpluses. So we certainly are very blessed with all of you. Um, the last page is our capital. Now, capital is, is a dedicated account, so it is not something that we budget for specifically. It's like a savings account. Um, the money stays in there, you don't lose it, it's, it's always there. But what we do try to do is project what's coming up for the next five years. So I try to share this whenever we have big projects coming up so that people get an idea of, of what we see on the horizon. And I kind of try to break it out. It's very rough estimates and costs. We're not going out and getting quotes. Just best guesses so that we have an idea of what we've got going on. Um, so one, the first thing on there is the transition of the worship center lighting, which is actually something we're presenting tonight. So we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a bit. Uh, worship center air conditioning condenser. It's something we've been told is going to break. It hasn't yet. We've been working off it for like five years, so we're doing really good running the risk, and one day we'll come in and it'll be super hot. <laughs> and then um, we are looking at tuck pointing the exterior of the building. That is something that's still coming up, um, being worked on. Those are things kind of left yet for this year that we haven't finished. We'll probably fall into next year as well. And then you can see next year, we're looking at replacing our phone system. We are looking at um, windows, not the stained glass, but the regular windows are getting bad. We need a copy machine replaced. Um, just kind of things out on the horizon. So it just gives us a rough idea of what we're looking at as we go through. 
And then I just put a note on there of what our average, it's not on your handout, but it is on the screen. Currently the balance is $208,000, and on average we take in um, about 1,600 to that account. So it does continue to grow, people continue to support it, and it really is very helpful um, when it comes up to different expenses that we have. So that is everything I have for the budget. I'm sure everybody loves this topic, but if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Yeah. He's coming with the microphone. Going back one page to this graph. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're set for 23. For 24, you're talking about be over 200,000 then? For, I don't know what 24, 2024 will bring? The, next, the following year, you mean? Correct. I mean, 23 is taken care of here, I mean, on the graph, because we have the surplus. To, to a degree. To a degree. Um, I, not all of it is being hit for 23. We're not looking at a surplus for 24, are we? Don't know. We budget a zero, and we see what happens. Okay. Don't know. Hopefully. She asked, what is replace RISO? So a, the RISO is a machine. It's a duplicating machine that is in the office, and it is a less expensive way to make photocopies. It duplicates things really, really fast. That's what we use for bulletins and things where we make a lot of copies. It's often found in a school and churches. Yeah. I, I was had to leave and I came back. Um, did anybody mention anything? Is there anything in the budget about maybe having someone look after our safety equipment? Like we bet we needed it Sunday morning and the defibrillator wasn't working. It was out for repairs and why didn't we have one that did work mm -hmm. while that was in repair? And all of our little medicine Mm -hmm. Little first aid kits. You can't even use the band-aids. They're so old. They don't even work, stick. You know, I think we either have to ask one of the first responders that belong to our church if they would check them maybe every other month or, or something and make sure that all our equipment is working the way it should. Mm -hmm. And... Um, if something has to be in the shop to get repaired, then we get a replacement until we get our own back. You know, something needs mm -hmm. to be done. I mean, Sunday the man turned out okay, but mm -hmm. maybe the next person won't. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really concerned about that. I do, I do understand that. So what we do do, um, every June I go through all of the first aid kits. I do it once a year, I throw away all the old stuff, um, I don't test all the band-aids, so I will do a better job with the band-aids. If you see bad ones, throw them away. Um, but I do replace, I try to replace the kits throughout. I check all the, um, the expiration dates and um, all of that sort of thing. We do have a jump bag, which I have. I, I am not skilled enough to, to uh, look through, but I actually did talk to someone today who is an um, EMT, and he's going to stop by and take a look at that. and get it back to where it should be, or see if it's even appropriate for us to have um, here in the building. So that's kind of being worked on. As far as the AED, it went out of service, and I purchased a new one the day it went out of service. There is a massive nationwide shortage on AEDs. You can't get them anywhere um, unless you borrow or steal somebody's. So. <laughs> Um, we found out that we are going to, Lutheran High is going to borrow us one in the interim. Um, I talked to the company again on Monday morning. They still can't give me a date. He said, hopefully in the next 13 weeks. But he said, you're waiting along with the rest of America. Apparently there's chips from China, you know, and you can't get anything. So I totally understand. 
and I wish that it would be here. Um, but we will hopefully have at least a temporary one um, in the interim until it comes. But it, it is on order. They charged my credit card the first day. <laughs> um, so we are working on it. And I, I completely understand. Um, we one will of the, do what we can. Yeah, one of the assumptions that we were under, we knew that it was going to be a wait. We were thinking at most three, four weeks and we would have one here. Uh, we were not expecting to be without an AED for two months and then to hear oh, it could be another eight to 13 weeks before you get one. Um, so communication was a little lacking on the timetable. Um, the one that we ordered, we did order the one, same unit that the Falls EMT and Fire Department has. And, and the reason we did that was be, so that if there is an incident here, they can simply un unplug the wires plug into their unit and go immediately without having to switch over all units and all, the, mm -hmm. all that stuff. So we, we were taking into consideration the fact that we want to make this as smooth as possible, not knowing. It's on a boat from China. Yeah. <laughs> a slow boat, right. So it is being worked on. It is not in this budget. There is medical supplies in the budget. Um, I do that every year when I refill everything. And I haven't done it for June yet, but it, June's not over. So I'm working on it. <laughs> Other questions on the budget? Yeah. The old one junk then, or can it be repaired? Do we have another one here? Yeah, so what I did do is I ordered a battery, which is supposed to be coming this week. Um, and if it does, we would keep that one as well and probably put it over in the gathering place area. And then we would have two as a backup. Um, so I'm hoping that will fix it. We do replace the batteries. I keep track of it. This one died much earlier than it said it would. Um, so, you probably don't have a backup unit that you can get to do all this. Not when everybody wants one. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just don't. I, we've tried. <laughs> Other questions on the budget? Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll be looking for a motion to approve the budget. Got it. And a second? And a second. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you. We'll let Stephanie get caught up here with her notes before we hand the mic right back to her. Okay, Worship Center Lighting Project. It is me. Okay, so the Worship Center Lighting Project, there is nothing in your packets about this. Um, so what we are looking at doing is we're talking about replacing lights. It's these lights right here. All the banks that you see that are spotlights um, throughout the building, or oh, throughout this room. There's some over in the corners. There's actually some up in the cupola, uh, some in the back. So they're, they're in various spots throughout this, throughout this room. Um, so several years ago, probably five or so plus, we did replace all of these, the chandeliers, with LED lighting. Um, the primary reason is it's very hard to change these light bulbs. Um, we have to get a lift, we have to get an articulating lift because we have to go over the pews. So it's really, really challenging to change the light bulbs. Um, and it is also more energy efficient, the, the way technology has changed. So now we are also looking at the spotlights. We have been putting this off for many, many years because it was really expensive. Um, I was initially told around the over $50,000 mark um, to change those uh, lights out. So with time, I have been occasionally talking to electricians to see when it would start coming down in price. 
So we've gotten to the point where the council felt comfortable bringing it to the congregation. Um, one of the main reasons is, I kid you not, every time we rent a lift, we change every bulb because we have to pay to bring in a lift and it's a big project. So we just automatically change all the bulbs. Within a week, one goes out. It happens like every time. Um, Thomas isn't here, but he's always singing up here and he said, it's just unbelievable. We change them and then one goes out. Um, the pastors know it. These two are out now. I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, so, so it's, it's constantly an issue changing the bulbs up there. So what we are looking to do is replace the cluster, shoebox clusters, they call them, throughout the worship center. Um, and it does give us 88% less energy uh, usage. All of our lighting in here then would be LED. And there is one sample bulb in this unit. It would be the second from the wall, if anybody wants to take a look. Um, it doesn't change the look too much. They, it has, still has the soft look. We wanted to test it. We wanted to make sure it works. Um, we went out and talked with multiple electrical companies. Most of them would not quote it. One. I found one that was willing to actually quote it. They had to work with the manufacturer because they're retrofitting the um, shoebox cluster to fit that LED light, um, which is kind of a new thing um, without having to replace the entire unit, if that makes sense. So um, we are at the point now where the church council has reviewed the quote and um, gone through everything. And so they are recommending to the congregation that they, we approve this project. It would be $30,000, and it would come for the cap, from the Capital Improvement Fund, um, which at this point has $208,000 in it. Oh. And that is everything I have on that. But I, in kind of conjunction, but not completely, um, you may have heard that last week we had a power surge come through the building um, with the storms that came through, and it damaged our dimming panel, which is up in the front closet. Um, it's, this is kind of a side note, but slightly related because of the lighting. Um, so it fried several things, like they're actually black. These two lights specifically, which is why they're out over the altar, um, so those won't turn on. And then we have several that won't turn off um, unless you flip the breakers. So it's really very interesting what's going on um, in the dimming panel. So they are working on getting a quote. Our biggest issue right now is that it's a very old panel. It's 25 years old. You can't get parts. They don't make it anymore. Um, so the electrician is, I talked to him yesterday again. He said, I'm still working on trying to get quotes to see if we can get this panel replaced, um, if we can get parts for one, or we might have to replace the entire thing. It is very expensive. Um, I've been told fifty dollars to $100,000 dimming panel. Um, <laughs> I have also talked to our insurance agent um, because it is... Um, an act of God, per se. So uh, he, it likely will fall under our insurance. Um, so I just want people to know that that's in the process. It will probably be a while before it is fixed. We, we do have lights. We're just a little dark in this area. Um, and it slightly might affect this project. If anything, it might reduce the cost because some work had to be done in the panel for these lights which now might end up being part of the insurance claim. Um, so I'm just, I don't know if it will change. When I talked to him, I talked to him about the project. He said, if you're taking it to your congregation, you can let them know, but just approve the full amount. And if it's less, great. That way we're covered. Um, they won't start this project until we get the panel figured out. Um, but the timing is everything. We're all here, so I thought, well, I'll still present it and, and see how things go. So, um, questions on the lighting? Yes. Shoebox cluster. Multiple. 
There are right, here, right. here, there's some in there. Okay. I'm looking at the big ones over here. Yes. Did you ever look at tearing them out and putting something else in replacement? We did. We talked about that. We talked about dropping them lower um, so that we could reach them. <laughs> um, but then we run into issues with the screens and having it be in the way of the screens and casting shadows. Um, and really, at that time, the when we talked last, the cost was very similar, if not more, because they have to change the wiring to get it into the dimmer panel. This allows us to use what we currently have. What function are they for? For the choir? For the piano? Or yes, all of all of those things. These fo focus on the choir, then these focus here on the altar. We have the band over there. The band is the one who complains the most because they can't read their music. You can ask Chad, he's sitting next to you. Um, <laughs> they complain a lot about the lighting. I was gonna buy them those little headlights, but they weren't crazy about that. They're like a buck. <laughs> so you're saying you couldn't bring those lights down further for them and also over here? Not without getting into the screen, we'd be able to bring them down just a slight, not enough that we'd still be able to reach them. So, Jeff. Okay, you talked about the power surge last Monday. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was here when that happened. You were uh, here. <laughs> don't, uh, don't we have surge protectors on our circuits? Yes, so there is a surge protector on the dimmer panel um, it is old technology, and the surge, they told me, must have been damaged in the past in a previous power surge, but we never knew it because if you look at it, it's just a box. It has no lights. It has nothing. It will be replaced now with the new power surge, which has a green light and a red light on it all the time. So now, once we fix it, um, after power surges, I always walk the building and I check various things. There's lots of things we turn off. Um, we'll know that we need to check it and make sure there's a green light. But at this point, that technology wasn't in there. Um, so we didn't, it, it had absorbed a surge in the past, which wrecked it, damaged it. Okay, so hopefully with the new technology, we will not suffer this type of a- Correct. Catastrophe again. Correct, Thank that you. would be the goal. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll be looking for a motion to approve the $30,000 coming from the Capital Improvement Fund to complete the, uh, complete the Worship Center lighting project. Motion, and, and do we have a second? No, Bill. Okay, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? All right, thank you, Stephanie. I know this has been a fun project, right? <laughs> um, okay, next up is the, the call for the DCE. All right, so we are looking to extend a call for a director of children and family ministry to uh, Miss Cassidy Holesso. Uh, her information has been in your weekly news for the last couple of weeks. Um, going, let's back up here for a second. Um, after Andrea had, uh, Andrea, excuse me, had declined our call, um, we finished up the Easter season, and then the committee met. Oh boy. Let me use this. All right, first, here's the committee. Uh, myself, Nicole, Donna Felch, Chad Berkey, so we had a couple of council members on there. Keith Schmidt, who's an elder, Sarah Gartman, Stephanie Trakel, Megan Horn, Amanda Hildebrand, and Andrea Berlin. Uh, going back, uh, July of 2021, Jeff Diener resigned his call. Uh, Andrea returned our call that we sent out, oh, back in February, I wanna say it was. Um, <clears throat> 
she, when she returned that call, we were in the middle of Lent. We got through the Easter season. The call team met again um, a couple of times. The first meeting was to go through uh, previous information packets that we had received on various candidates. And then we had also been sent an additional packet from the district which had Cassidy's information in it. Uh, we met in May and agree, uh, did a couple of, of rankings uh, and a few interviews as well. Cassidy uh, was the one that the call team agreed to recommend to council in May, and that was approved then by council, which is why it's here before you this evening. Uh, just some biographical information on Cassidy. Cassidy was born in California, raised in Michigan. She graduated from Concordia University, Chicago in 2021. I always want to say River Forest because that's what it was called when I was in college. Um, but it's Concordia, Chicago now. Uh, she re received her bachelor's degree in religious education. Her major was uh, DCE, so exactly what we're looking for, and she minored in social work. Um, she has been involved in a couple of different ministries. While she was in Chicago, she did um, some field work programs at a church that is called Trinity Roselle. Tr Trinity Roselle is a very um, well-known church in the Chicago area, uh, has a very flourishing youth program. I, I think that's the best way I can put it. Uh, very involved, lots of different activities going on. Her internship, now this is as she's wrapping up school, her intern internship was a call to St. John uh, Defiance, Ohio. Uh, she served there kind of in a generalist position. After her internship, they extended her a call. So then she took on some more responsibilities, uh, specifically around the areas of youth family confirmation, children's mes messages, and they also added her into teaching religion in their day school. Um, as well as helping with the chapel program. Uh, she's only served in this position. I, I've been asked this question, so I'm gonna throw it out there right away for you all. Uh, she just graduated. Why is she looking for a call already? Um, so in my conversations with Cassidy, there is some tension between the church entity and the school entity. She is called to the church However, most of her time and her work is spent in the school. She's caught in the middle, uh, which puts her in a very uncomfortable position, which is why she's been willing and looking to be removed from that position, where she's not having to play both sides of the fence, if you will. Um, when we interviewed Cassidy, uh, her sense of calling, um, you wanna help me, Nicole, here? Some of these? Um, <laughs> so Cassidy definitely has a heart and a passion for the gospel. Uh, definitely, is in, but she's been involved a lot with youth ministry, is looking to advance her skill set as well, get involved in some different areas, including youth. She's done, a, or excuse me, including children's ministry. Uh, she's done some of that in the past. Uh, she understands that that's the position, that's the age group we're looking for, is children ages three through fifth grade and their families. Um, I don't know if you want to talk any more about that. Uh, understanding of the church's mission. There again, uh, how do I want to say this? I'll throw this one to you. Um, she has a good grasp. Of, she has been Lutheran, um, from what we can tell, most of her life has grown up in the church. Her mom um, was very active in their church and led a lot of trips for youth gatherings and whatnot. So she understands the church's mission and has a, a broad sense of that, having grown up in it um, her whole entire life. So she has a good sense of, of what the church is um, and the mission to connect people to Christ. Children's ministry style, there again, she's just started getting into this in the last year. She enjoys working with children. Uh, that's not been a core emphasis of what she's done in the past, uh, but she totally understands what we're looking to call for. Uh, seemed excited, enthusiastic about that. Lots of, she's, I don't know how old, 21, 22. She's young and vibrant. She's young. 
She's young, full of energy, okay? So she's excited about the opportunity to dive in, uh, to grow her skills. Uh, strengths, I'll throw that one back to you if you want to share um, some Kind stuff. of piggybacking off the young, um, also moldable was the phrase that came up. Um, she's not set in her ways, and Sunday school needs to look like this, and Wednesday night needs to look like this. Um, there's a lot of moldability there, um, being that she is young but is excited and just wants to pour into children um, and then turn them to Christ and reflect that in all that she does. So, And there again, um, one of the strengths, being involved with a church like Trinity Roselle, she's been exposed to a lot of good programs in the past. Where she is currently, um, how do I want to say it? She's been restricted a little bit to the material that they use, to the programs that they run. They need to come uh, directly from our publishing house, okay? Um, that's the way that their church has done it. That's the way they do it. Um, good, bad, right, or wrong, that's another story. So she's got lots of involvement in other things and knows how to take a, a very good curriculum and Lutheranize it um, and make it something that's fittable, moldable for our kids. Um, so she's been involved in that as well. Um, questions, comments? Got one up here. When she comes here, who's going to be her boss? Not, I'm saying... The other church, she had a problem. She was in the middle. She's going to come here, what boss? Correct. And who's that going to be? Okay. Um, so all of the ministry, ministry directors, Thomas, Nicole, this DC, Stephanie, they all report to me. So that, that'll be... Either one of those people that report to you she comes to you for, I mean, if they have advice, they give it to you and you give it to her so she doesn't have a problem, correct? <laughs> We've not had an issue with that kind of thing in the past. We work very well together as a team. Um, I think both of the directors who are here can attest to that. We do throw ideas off each other, um, but ultimately, you know, she would be responsible for youth or children. I want to keep saying youth. Nicole's not going anywhere, and she nags on me every time I say youth. Um, she would be responsible for children's family ministry. So certainly she could come to me with ideas. She could talk to Nicole. She's ultimately got to make the decision, uh, good, bad, otherwise. And we then would give feedback. Hey, we see that this is working really well. Uh, this isn't working well. How can we adjust? How can we pivot? We've worked really well together as a team in all of those situations. We've not had an issue where... Um, somebody has to come directly to me because somebody's putting feedback into a ministry. We've not had an issue like that. It, it, and correct. It's not, and, and there again, I think it's the, the issue between the church and the school. Her call is to the church, but she's spending her hours, a, a large chunk of them, in the school. And with those two entities butting up against each other, um, she's caught in the middle. Any other questions? Amanda was on the call team. Do you want to add anything? Um, I think just to kind of uh, respond to the concern about potential conflict here, my sense is that she would be a very good cultural fit here. I feel like she would really um, connect well with, with the team and the ministry and the kids. She's got a very great personality for that. So I'm excited to call her. Young, vibrant, energetic, all those things. Okay, if there are no further questions, we will be looking for a motion to issue a call to Cassidy. We have a second? We've got multiple hands. Uh, okay, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? All right, well, thank you uh, to the call team. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Yes, that's a good question. So what are the next steps? Where do we go from here? Uh, paperwork, paperwork will be signed uh, this evening, tomorrow, and will go in the mail. Uh, I will contact her tomorrow morning and let her know that the call has been extended by the congregation. Uh, probably after she takes a couple of days, looks at the paperwork, figures out her schedule, um, we'll see if she'd like to make a visit to St. Paul. Uh, if she does, uh, it is, we've done this in the past. Um, it's hard right now because obviously confirmational WANA, those types of programs aren't up and running in the summer. But what we will do is what we did with Andrea. She came over winter break where there weren't those programs running either. We'll have her meet with staff. We'll have her meet with a couple of core families uh, just to get her foot in the door to meet some key people, leaders, volunteers, and we'll have a meeting with her with church council and elders, uh, select volunteers who'd like to meet with her. So that, and then that kind of gets her in the door, gets her to be able to open up, ask any questions she would have, um, get a feel for who we are, what we're about, um, and then really at that point, the ball is in her court. Um, typically people, I say this and I, I don't know. When I, when I graduated, when I went through seminary, the advice was if you get a call, you respond within two to three weeks. Yes, I'm taking it, no, I'm declining it. I don't know what the advice was when you got it. Um, the last one we had sat on it for, well, it was a couple weeks. So once she accepts the call, then it'll, you know, if she were to accept the call, then it would be arranging, moving, getting her here, getting her settled, signing paperwork. So I don't have a date for you on when she could potentially start. The goal is to have her in place by fall if she were to accept the call. Probably, um, I, I, that would be a kind gesture. Uh, St. John Defiance, I don't know if, how do I want to put this? Defiance is quite a bit, Defiance is a, a small town. It's a rural community. Um, it's a town of five, six hundred. Um, they do have a school attached, so they do have some draw and pull from the area into it. Uh, the congregation, I think the average attendance was right around 200, I want to say, uh, or 250, somewhere in there. So, there's, there is some difference. She is. One of the questions that we ask in our interview is always, uh, St. Paul is a larger congregation in the LCMS. How do you feel about that? Does that excite you? Does that scare you? Um, and she said, she's up for anything. Um, <laughs> so she said it, it did bring some excitement. It did bring a little bit of uh, worry, kind of anxiety, uh, coming to a church this large. Um, but she said she was excited about the opportunity uh, to be here. So, anything else? Thank you all for approval of this. I appreciate it very much. Okay, uh, real quick before we get to the congregational concerns, um, just so everybody's aware, uh, since Jeff resigned, Nicole's kind of been, I guess, doing double duty. Is that safe to say? Double duty plus. Uh, so just want to thank her for, uh, for all of her efforts in the last 12 months, 13, 13 months. Okay, well, uh, we, next will be congregate. Oh. So we do have uh, two outgoing council members we also want to thank, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Mark Sobracco and Michelle Bohm. Uh, thank you guys for your service and everything you do for the congregation. Um, your... Okay, uh, we do have one uh, item already on the congregational concerns and I think we'll start with that. We'll pass the microphone to Jim, Jim Fossey uh, to talk about the endowment grants. At the last congregation meeting, there were a number of questions about the endowment fund. So we thought that we would 
uh, at each congregation meeting, just come up with a few talking points to give you some information since it is a significant uh, dollar amount that is in the endowment fund at, at the current time. So on that first page uh, of the endowment section, uh, that lists the grants that we gave out this spring. There were 10 grants and they're all listed there for you. And the total amount that we granted was $31,000. Uh, and as we said in the past, basically what we're giving away each year is 5% of the total of the endowment. There is a second little rule that goes into play that says after that, each year, we can only give away either 5% more or 5% less than that dollar amount based on what the market is doing. So right now, if you've looked at your 401k or if you've looked at your investment, it's not doing so good. So uh, I would assume our balance is pretty low. So if we took 5% of that balance, assuming that the year continues as it is, that balance would be pretty low. So we never want to uh, come up with a year where what we give away is very, very small. So a second rule is that we will not give away anything less than 5% of what we gave away the previous year. So that would mean this year, we would not give away anything less than $29,000. If the market does extremely well, the maximum that we could give away next year is $32,000. So it's just a little extra rule to protect the gifts and the grants that we give away each year. The second page, there was a question at the last meeting, if we could give you a pie chart showing how the investments uh, are, in, uh, how all the, uh, the dollars are invested. And that pie chart there shows you, and it lists on the right side of it, the different types of funds that it's invested in. Now, we have the money invested in the Lakeshore Community Foundation, and all of their money is invested this way. And our money is invested exactly that way as part of the total. And w within our bylaws, we have an investment policy that we had put together when we started the fund, which is a very conservative investment policy so that we don't have money invested in junk bonds, uh, wild schemes where we could potentially lose it all. So it's a very conservative policy and the policy of the Lakeshore Community Foundation mimics that very, very closely. So uh, because of that, we weather the storm very well. And above the pie chart, you can see that as of May 31st, uh, the total market value of the Lakeshore Community Foundation was down 10%. I do not have a number of what it is right now I can only guess that that number might be 15, 18, I don't know. But again, because of our investment policy, we weather the storm very, very well. Are there any questions about the endowment fund? Uh, the advisory fee that we pay, uh, I believe it's one half of 1%. I could be wrong, but I believe that's the amount. Uh, one other thing that uh, I will report on, uh, I'm heading up a group here within the congregation. The found the the LCMS Foundation is offering a service of estate planning seminar. There's a gentleman that works in the South Wisconsin district and he will help congregation members do estate planning to any degree. 
very little or a whole lot, and they will do that all at no charge. It is a service to the South Wisconsin District, to our congregation. And we will be holding a seminar in early October. So if there is anyone that's interested in getting assistance in estate planning at no cost, they can see myself, see Pastor Kyle, talk to the office, we'll get your name, and we'll get you on the list to get together with the gentleman from the, uh, from the LCMS Foundation. Okay, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Jim. Are there any other congregation concerns? This one's kind of for Pastor Kyle. Um, just curiosity-wise, in the summer services, is there any thought or do you occasionally think about whether we would go with maybe two services instead of three on Sundays during the summer months, just? Um, that is a discussion for the elders to have. So it will be brought up at some point. Uh, nothing will change for this summer, uh, but potentially down the line, if that's something the elders feel is the right move for St. Paul, um, we'll evaluate that at that time. It is on the radar. Yep. Bill. Thank you. A couple months ago, Pastor Kyle and I were talking and uh, He's a generous guy. A gentleman came into church and needed some gas money and he gave it out of his uh, back pocket. I think the church should have a, at your next meeting in the next hour, have $100 on the side. And if the pastor, either one of them decide to give somebody some money, it should come out of there. I don't think it should come out of the, the pastor's pocket. Oh, you do? Okay. There's a, there's a sustenance fund that was created. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there is actually, we do have some cash on hand locked up for that purpose. I'm not sure why he didn't use it. <laughs> Just take a look at look on his face right now. I just had another question about emergency services. At each service, are there ushers there that have training in emergency services? Or who do we look to if there is an emergency? So the usher captain has been informed that there are first aid kit, where those things are, the jump bag, the AED, they're there to help bring the initial wave. Um, obviously not all of them have EMS training, or you know, CPR training or things like that, uh, we've been very blessed. We do have lots of people in our congregation who have those skills, whether it be from nursing background, uh, EMTs, firefighter, police, uh, who have jumped in in those cases. So they're informed of where the equipment is in the building. Um, they know that, hey, there is an emergency, go get it, um, and then kind of get out of the way and let the people who have the training do what they need to do. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Well, for instance, at 7.45 on a Sunday morning, we can be assured that there's somebody that knows all these things. They know where the stuff is. They know how to make the call. None of us are... Is your question, are there people at each service trained on using the AEDs and the equipment? Is that yes. We do occasionally offer um, CPR training to the ushers if they take us up on it. Um, so some probably have been trained, but not necessarily all of them. We usually do it every couple of years. We actually were just talking, it's probably time to offer it again. Um, I don't think we can guarantee that somebody would be here that is specifically trained, but they all know how to use a phone to call. Um, they all know where the equipment is, how to start the process, um, at least, so. Thank you. Are there any other questions or concerns? We got one in the front. For 
for security reasons, for some time, number of months are here, we have one entrance that's open. What's the next level of security that we have? I'm gonna hand that one over to Stephanie. Um, so, for worship times, so we do, we have the main entrance only open, that way the ushers can, they are asked and trained to keep an eye on the individuals walking in. Um, and then if somebody were to get past that, we do have panic buttons. He has one in his hand, it's in the pulpit. There's one up in the sound booth. Um, the head usher. The head usher has one. Um, they push it and it will call the police and they are, will be on their way. Um, so that is our next um, set of backup. You aren't. The usher captain should. Okay, we will follow up with your group. I'll make a note. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. And second? Yeah, Bill. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Pastor, you want to wrap us up in prayer? Sure. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for our time together. Uh, we thank you that we can come and deal with the business of the church, and uh, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. We've seen them tonight again. Uh, how richly you have blessed this congregation through volunteers, through people, through uh, gifts. Uh, it is amazing, the outpouring, uh, the support that you have provided through people, through, through means uh, to this congregation. And so we are so grateful uh, for that. Uh, we ask that you continue to uh, be with us, continue to bless our work and the ministries that we have. Uh, we pray for Cassidy. Uh, as we are going to soon extend a call to her uh, in the next day or two, uh, we ask that you would bless her, watch over her, uh, give her wisdom as she deliberates this call. Uh, if she is to come make a visit, we ask that you would give her safe travel and that you would lead her ultimately to the place that you would have her serve uh, the church, whether it be here or remaining at her current call in defiance. Uh, Lord, just give her wisdom over this whole process. Uh, Lord, once again, we are thankful, and so uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence in all that we say and do, and that our focus continues to be connecting people to the good news of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Thank you all.